Good morning. Uh, my name is Mike Baker. I'm the uh, Beef Cattle Extension Specialist uh, in the Department of Animal Science here at Cornell University. And uh, my topic this morning is to talk about something that has uh, really grown in interest and popularity uh, over the last uh, 12 to 18 months in particular, uh, and that is the uh, dairy cross beef calf. Um, as with any uh, enterprise or uh, potential enterprise, uh, there's uh, some things to think about, uh, and I've uh, called this topic the good, bag and the ugly, uh, in part because of my uh, uh, enjoyment of uh, Clint Eastwood. And, and I did try to find uh, the, uh, uh, that uh, uh, theme song for the, uh, the movie, but I, I couldn't, I don't have the technology to put it in my, uh, uh, slide set, so you'll just have to hear it in the back of your head. But the good thing about the dairy cross business is uh, we've got uh, 625,000 dairy cows, uh, according to the 2018 census in the state, which uh, gives a tremendous uh, uh, amount of cattle that could be marketed, and that's one of the things that we know increases the value is to be able to market in volume. Uh, it also, the way the dairy is structured, uh, there's calves available every month of the year. And again, we know from a marketing standpoint and utilization, uh, that's extremely important as well. The demand for choice beef is increasing. Uh, this is uh, very good for the, the dairy industry uh, because Holstein's uh, dairy breeds uh, actually have a higher marbling percentage relative to beef at the same amount of back fat. So the, one of the higher uh, marbling breeds actually is the Jersey uh, Holstein right behind it. So uh, since there's an increase in demand, uh, these uh, dairy crosses can fit in very well. We've got 3 million acres, give or take. That number uh, is, is quoted differently, uh, but Suffice it to say, there's a lot of acreage that's uh, not utilized. Uh, dairies have restructured, gone to land that is more suitable for row crop production, leaving hillsides, clay soils, those types of uh, resources available. Uh, ruminants can make really good use of that land, and, and these dairy cross, beef cross calves could fit right in. We've got lots of forage and water. Uh, we, we know that sometimes we have too much water, but very seldom do we have too little water. Uh, if our droughts uh, exist, they're usually for short periods of time compared to other parts of the state. I've got a lot of former dairy facilities uh, that uh, are currently empty. Uh, these younger calves need some type of housing, uh, so a uh, huge investment in housing is not necessarily uh, required. And finally, there's a system of cooperative extension uh, educators that are growing with uh, skills in the area of livestock expertise. And so the support uh, is uh, uh, is, is beginning to be there more so than it was before. Uh, the bad, and you got to understand, is that these cross calves are not uh, the old mortgage lifter that we think about of the hogs back in the 30s and 40s. Uh, at best, they're going to be an, an additional income strain, uh, but they're not going to, uh, to save uh, the family farm. But uh, done correctly, uh, we do see opportunities to add value and therefore income to the farm. Our biggest challenge, we have a positive corn basis, uh, and so finishing may or may not uh, work in New York. Uh, it may be the type of deal that we raise them to uh, three to 700 pounds in that range and then send them to areas of the country that have uh, cheaper corn uh, to make these work. Uh, I think that remains to be seen. We don't have a strong finishing uh, industry in the state. Uh, the finishers that are here uh, have done a very good job and, and figured out how to use uh, byproducts and some unique resources. Uh, but I, I, I just don't know if we're gonna grow that industry to uh, any great extent. We don't have a system of calf ranches. When you think about New Mexico and California and Nebraska and some of those states, uh, they have huge calf ranches from 10 to 30,000 head uh, in calf hutches. So 
our environment is a little challenging to do that. Uh, so getting these calves raised is going to be a challenge, especially given the fact that the good is we've got the wet environment. The bad is we've got the wet environment. So uh, uh, housing becomes a, a little bit more critical. Our cost of production to weaning we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, that remains to be seen uh, how we can compete uh, with these very large scale calf ranches uh, and what our competitive advantage may be here in the east. The reputation of the crossbred calf is not very good. Uh, unfortunately for years and years and years uh, uh, an Angus or a Hereford bull from a sale barn with no background or pedigree whatsoever was brought in just to uh, catch up uh, cows and, and heifers that, that didn't breed. Uh, so you constantly, uh, consequently ended up with a, what essentially was a, a black Holstein. Uh, and so those uh, don't have a good reputation and we'll talk about that in terms of how to get away from that because if we don't, uh, this program is not going to work very well. And then finding market infrastructure. Uh, we're challenged to be very honest in, in how to market, whether it be uh, newborn calves or 300 pound calves or 600 pound calves in large load lots. And, and we know from uh, a lot of experience that uh, the larger the number, uh, the more profitable uh, the, uh, or more competitive the prices can be. And finally, the ugly. Uh, raising calves is risky, both from a health standpoint and a market risk standpoint. Uh, we don't know uh, what the prices are going to be in, in 18 months uh, after this calf hits the ground. Uh, we can do some projections, uh, certainly, uh, but uh, market risk is, is, is real, and we need to recognize that. Health risk is real. Uh, these newborns, as you know, raising heifers, uh, can be challenging. Things can go along real well and then all of a sudden the bug gets in, introduced or, or overcomes the immune system and next thing you know you've, you've got a real wreck on your hand. It's going to require farmer co cooperation uh, and working in the beef industry, uh, getting uh, beef farmers to cooperate in, in marketing their calves. Uh, I know all about uh, the challenges to getting that done. And I was naive uh, and thinking we might be easier to do it with larger farms, dairy operations to make this happen. But I've been reminded that that may take some, uh, maybe a hurdle we're going to have to get over as well. Uh, the finished market may not be solid. We don't know, as I said, these black Holsteins have a, a bad reputation. Uh, packers have pushed back on the crossbred calves to a certain extent, but that's because of the quality of the crosses they are getting. So we have to be co cognizant of that and make sure that uh, we address that. Local ag service knowledge is weak. Uh, while I said extension educators are becoming more versed, uh, our, our veterinarians, uh, our feed folks, uh, they're just not as familiar with uh, raising uh, these kinds of animals uh, at least to seven, 800 pounds or even to the finish end. Um, feeding uh, beef animals is, is much different. Uh, Health care for beef animals is much different. So this will, will take some learning. Um, the other thing is we don't know what we don't know. This is a relatively new enterprise. Uh, what are some of the uh, challenges, hiccups, uh, hurdles we're going to face along the way? But it requires flexibility. And uh, those that can be flexible in terms of when to market, when to purchase calves, uh, all of those kinds of things at what weight, uh, those farms will be successful. If getting into a system where you raise newborns and you automatically sell them off 500 pounds, uh, it may work but it's not gonna be the most successful. You've gotta work with the market, uh, and the market is for these calves will be driven by the price of corn. And so we've got to uh, know more about how that works and how that affects uh, these, these cattle. So flexibility is gonna be key uh, for uh, this system to work. Why crossbreed? Well, she's got to have a calf every year, right? So what difference does it make if she has a, a Holstein calf uh, or a crossbred calf uh, in, in terms of getting her to lactation? 
neither. Uh, you don't need all those heifers. Uh, you've heard this from a lot of different folks. Uh, at $2,000 uh, to get a heifer to her first lactation, uh, the value of these heifers in the market may be $1,000, uh, 800 probably is more realistic. Uh, and so uh, they're cheaper to purchase than they are to raise. And crossbreds right now, as newborns, are worth a minimum of $80 a head more than the straight Holstein. And I've been watching this since last summer. There's been some concern this premium will decline as more calves come to market. Uh, to date, uh, that hasn't happened. Uh, but still yet, uh, it seems like a to me, a, a pretty much a, a no-brainer that uh, if you can get $80 out of calf just by using beef semen instead of Holstein semen, uh, it, uh, it makes some sense. So these are, this is a, a copy of a market, and, and if you want to track prices, um, just go to the Keef, uh, Cornell Beef Cattle Management. Uh, you can do an internet search for that term. Uh, and then go to market information and that'll bring you uh, to these USDA market reports. Uh, we have uh, five uh, personnel throughout the state that are, are reporting prices. Uh, this is, one is out of Cherry Creek, an empire market out in the southwestern part of the state. And my comparisons going forward will be the number one Holstein calf, bull calf. And see, they're still got some value to them. You know, at 60 to 72.50 uh, for that number one uh, bull. Now, granted, you drop down to utility, and they're worth 10 to 20 bucks. So, there's a, a big difference in the value of calves, uh, and whether, regardless of what, what you're selling. But taking the, the best Holstein and comparing it to the crossbred calves, you can see that nearly double the dollars uh, for, uh, in terms of dollars uh, per pound uh, for, for those crossbred calves. Uh, the most important graph is here on the right, and this is looking at the dollars per head of what these calves Brought and, and note from before that the, the Holstein bull was heavier uh, than, than the crossbred calf. So uh, that's factored into this as well. But starting from last June through the end of the year, you can see that the dairy beef calf is higher uh, in value uh, compared to the number one Holstein. And this is the difference ranging anywhere from uh, a low of, of uh, that would be what, in the neighborhood of $40 a head to a high of about $130 a head. So there is some variance uh, and, and that's gonna happen throughout. But the bottom line is they're still bringing a premium and probably will for a while. Average difference is about $80 a head. So one of the questions I get in particular from, from beef producers uh, is my uh, promoting or at least make increasing awareness of this crossbred calf, what's it gonna do to the beef market? Well, without going through all of the detail in these numbers, you can, can look at them at, at your leisure. But if uh, the, 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 the the bull calf makes up about 6% uh, on a national basis uh, of the beef supply. Uh, we live in a dairy state, so we think about dairy numbers being high, but in reality, you see that uh, the, uh, we have about um, 9.3 million dairy cows in the state, but we have uh, 30 million, 30 plus million of, uh, beef cows in the country. So uh, there, there's a tremendous more amount of beef cattle. And, and these calves are coming to market already. It's not as if we're going to get rid of them. They're just coming as Holstein uh, uh, fed calves uh, versus uh, crossbred. So the impact on the market uh, really is, is going to be so just to look real quickly, because uh, as I mentioned earlier, flexibility is, is going to be critical. Uh, and so knowing that market endpoints uh, will be part of being able to be flexible. Uh, we, and so we'll start out with the basics. Uh, we've got this cow-calf uh, operation and uh, calves are typically born in the spring, weaned uh, and, and sold in the fall. 
Uh, the cows kept on a relatively low pain, plane of nutrition in the winter time, uh, relative to what you uh, uh, experience in the dairy industry. And um, then pasture makes up the, the largest component uh, during the time of her lactation. So those weaned calves then go into a backgrounding program. Uh, and this is uh, what I refer to as a teenager phase. Uh, it's getting them ready to go on to uh, uh, the next uh, enterprise, uh, a little higher forage, or I'm sorry, a little higher grain sometimes in this diet, but it's still 50% uh, forage. They're looking uh, for a pound and a half, maybe two pounds a day gain. And then they can go to the stalker uh, or they can go directly to finish. Stalker uh, would be uh, 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 going to grass uh, in the spring, uh, adding uh, inexpensive gain to get them up to eight, 900 pounds before they enter the feedlot. Now, this isn't an exact model. I mean, these calves that are weaned can go direct to finish in some operations. Uh, and it, again, economics drives that decision and then the price of corn drives that decision. So, uh, but these are the market endpoints that we kind of think about. So how do they work? Uh, in terms of weights. Uh, so we've got selling the newborn at 80 to 100 pounds. Uh, the next crossbred calf I'm talking about now is going to be weaned at roughly, you know, 225, 250 in that range somewhere. Then it can go into a backgrounding program up to 550 or 750, uh, which may include a little bit of grass time as a stalker calf. Uh, and then it can go to stalkers uh, up to 900 before they go to finish. So, and, and again, these uh, uh, endpoints can be compressed. Uh, we have uh, in the old uh, Holstein feeding program, these calves at 250 would go right into a finish program so they would be finished at uh, no older than 14 months of age. Um, our question is, what the, in, and we needed to do that, that's what's referred to as the old calf fed Holstein program, and we need to do that to get that Holstein steer uh, carcass conformation to an acceptable level. Uh, we think, uh, we don't know because there's not a lot of research, we think we can use that crossbred calf um, and uh, 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 be able to extend that a little bit. In other words, we don't have to, if we get the, the beef influence in it, uh, we ought to be able to have a uh, uh, better ribeye shape and so on. So again, we don't know what we don't know and this, this is one area where that's true. So what weight should the calves be marketed? Uh, and of course, the typical extension answer is it depends, but it's really important because it depends on the market. It depends on your cost of production. Again, this is not a cookie cutter program uh, to be successful. And, and I, I want to step back and, and uh, Dr. Daryl Peel, who is an uh, Oklahoma State uh, 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 economist, uh, has delivered several programs to our beef producers in the state and especially on stocker cattle. And, and he said a producer will come to him and, and tell him his program, you know, buying calves at 500 pounds and putting two pounds a day again and selling them off at 750. And is this, is this the right uh, program to do? And his response is that's a very good play but it's not going to win the Super Bowl. In other words, we've got to have a lot of plays in our handbook to make this system work. And uh, if, if, if you don't enjoy flexibility, uh, this program's not for you, nor is the beef business. Uh, and then and, and that's, that's okay. We just need to understand that up front. So, um, so trying to get at the cost, you know, can, can we make this work? And one place to start is uh, Jason Carsis with Pro Dairy uh, has uh, collected data on some farms, uh, about 14 farms, I believe it was, uh, where they looked at the cost uh, to raise a calf uh, basically up to uh, a month or so uh, after weaning. Uh, and actually he took it all the way to his first lactation, but he did break it out to, uh, to, to just shortly after weaning. And the bottom line was it, it cost, uh, about $5 a day to do that. Or as we look at it in the beef 
uh, business a little bit more uh, frequently is the uh, total cost per pound of gain, not per day. So it's $2.80 per pound of gain. That's really high. Uh, to sell a calf at uh, 280, 250 uh, in that range at 280, uh, it's gonna be a challenge. So uh, when I put this together into a spreadsheet and I looked at these different endpoints of 250, 550, 750, 900 and finish. Uh, and if we started with this one at 250, it's costing us $2.80 uh, to a pound to getting there or about $450. Or I'm sorry, about uh, $600, including 150 for the calf. Uh, keep moving that up the line. We, if we jump down here and look at our uh, break even, 239 to do that on the five uh, the 250 a dollar 74 on the 550 a dollar 59 on the 750 so on and so forth to taking it all the way to finish you've got to uh, get a minimum of a dollar eight uh, with these previous prices in place what you want to know is what does that look like and so pulling numbers out of the uh, cattle facts, which is a national database uh, looking at, at prices and, and published uh, 550 pound steers brought a dollar 67. So that's under our break even. And this is in the last uh, five weeks of uh, uh, December. So th these are recent prices uh, to some extent. Uh, selling at 750, our break even was a dollar 59. We only got a dollar 46. However, when we jumped up to 900 pounds, our break even had dropped to a dollar 20, and the market was providing a dollar 42. Finish break even dollar eight. Market was providing a dollar 21. So at the heavier weights, it appears that these might work, uh, and. Um, so uh, the, what's driving that again is, is, is the price of corn. Uh, calves, uh, our, our corn is relatively uh, inexpensive. And so uh, they're gonna let you uh, put the weight on these, uh, uh, these calves down here, but they're willing to take them, they being the feedlot, willing to take them up here. One other scenario is in talking to some calf raisers, uh, that uh, they feel their expenses are lower, that they can get, if we look here, we can get uh, up to $342 uh, for that 250 versus six. So if we use that same scenario all the way up, you can see we have a much lower uh, break even if that in fact is, is uh, a, a true figure and it becomes a much more profitable deal all the way through. So again, we don't know what we don't know. Uh, we know pretty decently what it costs to raise heifers uh, that go into the uh, milking herd, but what about these crossbred calves? Are there some efficiencies we can gain along the way? One question that I often receive is a different way to look at this crossbred business is can we raise a calf uh, this out of a crossbred program as cheaply as a calf from the cow calf operation? Because that's essentially what uh, what's trying to happen. And I just want to mention to you, and I haven't done this before, uh, is this calf here is a Charlet Holstein cross. Now, other than he might be a little bit finer boned, uh, I think you'd have to agree he looks uh, to have quite a bit of beef confirmation. So with the right breeding, we can do this right. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. So here's some data, enterprise analysis data. So this is actual cost uh, collected on farms uh, done by the, uh, uh, out of the University of Minnesota. Uh, and these are farms, uh, their analysis is, is across the United States, but I pulled out farms that are in a similar climate uh, environment to us. And uh, basically, the, the break even uh, for all farms uh, for the last three years was $1.45. And it ranged pretty narrowly from $1.41 to $1.47.
Well, if you go back to and remember, whoops, I guess I didn't put that in, uh, uh, that uh, uh, back to and remember uh, that, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, yes, here it is. Sorry about that. These are our break evens uh, uh, for the operation. And if you go back here, uh, I should have included this on the slide. These are the prices being offered. So uh, we're in a better situation uh, in terms of being able to compete uh, with the Cal-Calf uh, uh, operation. Okay, so this is a chart that tracks the price of feeder cattle uh, from 300 pounds in 100 pound increments up to 600. Uh, this is data uh, collected at uh, Finger Lakes Livestock Exchange in Canandaigua uh, from 2012 to 2016, and it indexes the prices at different times of the year uh, relative to their weight. And what you see, and, and this index is, is repeated in, in other states, uh, so uh, we're not unique uh, here, uh, but it is uh, leading to potential uh, uh, decisions about when to get involved in this market, when to uh, have more numbers across bed calves uh, to go in, uh, because if, Obviously, the highest prices of the year are in this springtime period, what we're coming into uh, April, May. Grass fever kicks in. Uh, there's a lot of folks interested in, in putting calves out on grass. In fact, uniquely to New York, we sometimes are higher here than Virginia can be. Uh, but um, uh, so it may be a type of deal that having more crossbreds uh, available for that spring turnout uh, would make sense for you. Uh, conversely, the lowest price of the year is in September and October. Uh, this is when most of the calves become available nationally as well as in the state. It depresses the prices. So again, thinking about what your cost of production is, uh, if possible to, to stay out of this area, if you were thinking about raising them, maybe this is the time of year where you just sell them off as newborns uh, and uh, just try to target these higher markets. Don't screw this up. Uh, Tom Peters uh, is a consulting nutritionist in Wisconsin uh, and works in these crossbreeding programs, uh, is, is vehement about not having black Holsteins. In other words, just because they're black doesn't make them great. Uh, feedlots, uh, they're in the business to sell feed and to do it efficiently. And one of the uh, drawbacks to a Holstein we know is feed efficiency, uh, has a higher maintenance cost, uh, variety of challenges uh, in terms of feed cost. So if the crossbred is does not have better feed efficiency than the Holstein, does not have better carcass characteristics than, than the Holstein, uh, and doesn't gain as fast as, uh, doesn't gain faster than the Holstein, uh, then this is a program that's not gonna work and doesn't have a long future. Uh, and uh, that, that's the point that uh, he, was, he was trying to make. So what do we select for? And this is really important when you talk to your breeder uh, about the semen that they have to use on your Holstein cows. Now, fortunately, a lot of companies now have selected sire specifically for breeding to uh, dairy cattle. Um, and uh, so that's good uh, because just pulling out an Angus semen or a, a straw of Angus, uh, of an Angus bull is not the way to select uh, uh, your breeding. So this was a study done, well, 91, quite a number of years ago, where uh, Holstein steers uh, were fed in a calf-fed type program that is high rate of gain uh, compared to beef breed steers. And a final weight was not significant between Holstein and, and beef breeds. Uh, days on feed favored uh, the beef breeds. Uh, they did gain uh, faster. Uh, than, the, uh, than the Holsteins. Uh, dry matter per gain, again, the Holsteins were less efficient uh, than, the, than the straight breads. Uh, marbling, not difference, as I mentioned earlier. 
the marbling score on dairy breeds is high uh, relative to back fat. Confirmation, again, different muscle confirmation favored the beef, uh, beef breeds. And what we mean there in the ribeye is, is the major difference is a, a ribeye out of a beef uh, breed uh, tends to be round, uh, whereas the ribeye out of a Holstein tends to be oblong and flattened. Uh, the consumer has a preference one way or the other, uh, mostly for the round, and so we need to make sure that we uh, focus on that. Dressing percentage, hot carcass weight, uh, not different. Back fat actually favored the Holstein. The Holsteins had less fat, uh, and the ribeye area was smaller in the Holstein. And the sensory, not different. Okay, uh, and this has been bore out many times. Uh, the whole beef from a Holstein uh, animal uh, has the same flavor, uh, tenderness, uh, juice, juiciness, all of the characteristics that go into sensory, uh, the same as beef breeds. So, where do we differ? Pretty simple, right? Days on feed, average daily gain. All of these factors relative to feed efficiency and performance. Confirmation, also performance in the, in the carcass. And then finally, uh, carcass quality factors here. Fortunately, uh, this is not an EPD discussion, uh, which is the beef uh, uh, terminology uh, for selecting uh, uh, preferred genetics, but we have the genetic tools to improve this. We have the genetic tools to work on confirmation, back fat, ribeye area. So we can improve these uh, with using the right sire. And I've seen uh, data from some of these uh, companies uh, uh, that uh, uh, have beef bulls specifically for Holsteins uh, with data that looks very encouraging. No difference in, in all of these factors uh, as it relates uh, 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 to, to feed efficiency and carcass characteristics. So it can be done. Uh, we just have to make sure that you are selecting and you are insisting that your breeder know uh, what kind of uh, cattle, uh, what kind of sires, what kind of beef sires to put on these cows. Okay, so what's moving ahead? What do we have to do? We don't know what we don't know. There's a, a a dearth of uh, research, publicly available research, uh, and looking at this uh, crossbred calf. Uh, so we don't know. And we need to find that out so that we can help uh, producers make good decisions. Um, consistent supply, uh, again, 625,000. Uh, uh, dairy cows in this state, one would think uh, that uh, we could come up with a, a year-round supply um, easier than the beef uh, <clears throat> in this state, which there's only 100,000 uh, beef cows, uh, so roughly six times the number of dairy cows. So consistent supply, uh, we've got to do that, and it's going to take some cooperation. Uh, consistent quality. Again, breed composition, uh, because the dairy industry uh, is primarily uses artificial insemination, this should not be a difficult uh, issue. Uh, with beef cattle, uh, the primary uh, reproductive strategy is still the natural surface sire, uh, and so we have a tremendous amount of variability. Not so not the case with the dairy industry. We ought to be able to provide uh, a very consistent animal uh, at a consistent supply. Got to determine the, the, the specific endpoint. Again, I, I'm a little bit less uh, uh, certain about whether we can finish cattle economically. Uh, I'm not saying we can't. I just think we need to think more about uh, what drives the profitability uh, in that enterprise. But if we can use these calves on a forage program, uh, they could work. And, and I did forget to, to mention earlier on uh, Dan Fox, Dr. Dan Fox and his graduate students uh, a number of years ago did research here at Cornell where they looked at uh, putting these Holstein steers, again, not crossbreds, but Holsteins uh, on various forage 
uh, composition diets and then finish in and comparing the differences. And what they found is that the straight Holstein could be fed uh, a higher forage diet, which is uh, could be either a, you know a, a, an alfalfa or a hay crop silage kind of diet, or even to pasture up to roughly 500 pounds, uh, and still end up with a desirable carcass uh, compared to the calves that were fed on a high concentrate diet all the way through. So if we can do that with a Holstein steer, and that's going to be our cheapest feed source source is, is forage, and we have lots of it inexpensively. Uh, can these crossbreds go another 200 pounds and still have the right carcass? Uh, we don't know because the right combination of, of the beef sire, the right beef sire on, on the uh, dairy cow are just starting to come uh, on the ground now. So we've got a lot to learn but good indications we might be able to uh, stretch the time on forage. Uh, we need demonstration research to document performance. Uh, I was able to get a, a very small grant uh, for Northern New York where we're going to start to peck away at this, uh, looking at sires, looking at uh, feeding programs, and, and try to document the cost uh, as well as the performance of these crossbreds. And then finally, and this is I think where the dairy industry really is much more suited to this market infrastructure question, because if all of the previous bullet points there were put together and, and it appears that this is going to be a positive enterprise to, to get into, I've seen the tenacity of dairy producers uh, in building a structure that will work for them. Uh, and I'm encouraged that this can happen uh, because it's going to happen. There isn't one currently in place. Uh, if you put together an, a trailer load, which is roughly 50,000 pounds of calves at any of these various weights we've talked about, right now, by Honestly, to get the most competitive price, they're probably going to have to go out of state where the best market is, uh, and that doesn't exist. I mean, in terms of uh, 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 making that contact, so it's something that's going to have to be worked on uh, to build those relationships with outside buyers. Eventually, we're hoping that we can build that within state uh, because there's good examples in, in a lot of our eastern states where markets, auction markets, have taken this on to market trailer load lots of cattle and make it work, but it quite honestly is not there yet. So. This is uh, my quick and dirty uh, presentation on uh, the good, bad, and the ugly. Hopefully, it's provided you some things to think about. Um, Kathy's going to leave you uh, information to get in contact with me, uh, or I can give you that email now. Uh, it's mjb, Michael James Baker, mjb28 at cornell.edu, and I'd be uh, more than happy to talk with you about what I know and what we've learned uh, as we move into this uh, potential enterprise. So with that, uh, again, I hope you found some information you can utilize. And uh, if, uh, if interested and uh, have more questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you and have a good day.